because you're jumping back into the gap. I'll let the coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Coach, I wanted to let you know the dates for the two-day BI Academy weekends have been announced. The North American event will take place in Dallas, Texas, June 6th to 7th weekend. The Europe event will take place in Antwerp, Belgium, June 13th to 14th. Please go to basketballmersion.com slash clinics to get all the details as I want to bring as many as coaches as possible together for this interactive coaching development weekend. This year, the event is open to Basketball Immersion members and non-members. The BI Academy mission is simple. Share the game, help you become a better coach. Join this amazing community experience in Dallas or Antwerp. Go to basketballversion.com slash clinics. I am happy to announce that the Best in the West Coaching Clinic video series is now available for download. Get 11 full clinic videos featuring multiple sessions by Mike McKay, Alex Sarama, Yorick Michaels, Chris Oliver, plus single sessions from Lisa Tomadez, Shawnee Harley, and Dave Taylor. Go to www.bestinthewestclinic.com to watch a trailer and to learn more. Learn modern coaching ideas, not just on what to coach, but on how to coach as well, from some of the best coach educators currently sharing the game. A number of coaches have already reached out to me, grateful to be able to stimulate their coaching with so many unique ideas never shared or discussed on most coaching DVDs. Go to www.bestinthewestclinic.com to get these videos to download to be able to watch in the comfort of your home. I wanted to start this 100th episode with a big thank you to all of you that have supported the basketball podcast. Thousands of you have not only listened, but also shared the podcast with many of your coaching friends and colleagues. Thousands of you have also shared, commented, and given a shout out to the podcast on social media. I want you to know that All of that makes a big difference and continues to inspire me every day to continue to share the game. Thank you and enjoy this very special podcast with my wife, online entrepreneur, and former collegiate basketball player, Jen Oliver. To give you a quick idea of who my wife is, Jen Oliver is the author of the international best-selling book, The Love Fit Mama Way, Transforming the Core of Motherhood, and is the creator and host of the Fit Mama podcast, The Work In to your workout. As a core transformation coach, podcaster, and speaker, she is most passionate about spreading the message that if you love the body and life you have, you will have the body and life you love. I couldn't have asked for a better guest to have on for the 100th episode, a person that inspires me every day and is the person who pushed and challenged me to start this podcast in the first place. Coach, is something a little bit different for the 100th episode today. I welcome my wife, Jen Oliver. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, excited to be here. Excited to have you here. And we're going to get into certainly some things throughout the podcast, uh, the origin, a little bit of the podcast lessons of us being together on this journey. And uh, we both run online businesses and uh, certainly uh, we both experience the highs and lows of that and the life of a coach, so to speak, too. But Maybe I should ask you, why are you here today? (laughs) I felt like you need to be the feature of 100th episode. What do you think my answer to that was? No, thanks. Immediately, (laughs) no. Uh, So many great coaches uh, I've had on and so many coaches I'd love to talk to. So it kind of didn't feel right to certainly feature myself. So instead, I thought it would be better to be able to bring in my wife, so that we can engage in a little bit of conversation over some of the topics that maybe don't get covered enough or some of the things that we want to highlight about the podcast as well. And I want to start just with one of the first things that I learned from my wife that I think applies to coaching, especially in this era. And one of the first comments you made to me was about not generalizing. Can you explain that? (laughs) Well, I do remember when you and I started dating and we had a conversation early on where I don't know what it was about, but you made a comment, something like, wow, most girls don't like this or like, or do like this. Or I don't even remember what it was, but you used this line, most girls. And I was like, hold on. 
and I had a look at you and I said, there's one thing that you need to know about me. I am not most girls. And it's funny that I even look back and I know that I said that and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I said that, but I am. <laughs> well, it implies a lot to, to, to coaching, especially I think in this era where I think there tends to be, it's not just there, this era, every generation of coaches thinks that the players are different than their generation. And every generation of coaches thinks the players don't do things that they used to do. For example, you know, going to play pickup. Well, just, it brings up something that's really important. Number one is don't generalize, you know, and if I do, and I think I do sometimes on the podcast, I actually proceed it by saying, listen, I don't like generalizing, but and then I add a question that kind of is more of a general question. That's why we try and get a little bit more specific on the podcast with the different things that we dive deep into. But for example, kids not going to play pickup. Well, why do kids not go to play pickup? Like we can't generalize this generation and say, oh, they don't play pickup anymore. Well, it's dangerous at the park. Well, it's dangerous with your wife generalizing for her. So <laughs> it's certainly dangerous. I but, you generalize. but it's kind of it's kind of putting the blame on the kids. Yes. And it and it leaves us as, oh, we're the victims of them not playing mm. pickup. Well, meanwhile, we're the reason they don't play pickup. Mm. As adults, we have created this situation where kids have more structured play. And I'm not judging whether it's right or wrong. And we'll talk about that too. What I'm saying is this generalization is dangerous. So kids don't play pickup because we organize it. Kids don't play pickup because it's not safe to let your son or daughter just go to the park. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And I used to just go and come back, you know, who knows what. (laughs) So the point is it's a learned behavior for these kids. I mean, they wouldn't know it any differently. So how do we coach best? And that's part of my philosophy is that we have to create the environment. We have to create the environment for them to play pickup. If we don't create it for them, then they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies for so many things in coaching in terms of my philosophy of this game's approach and creating freedom and creating, you know, the possibilities for the players to be able to come up with their own decisions and their own solutions. And this concept of generalizing has stuck with me ever since you said that. And just, I relate it so much to coaching now and saying, yeah, no, I got to be very sure that I don't generalize to my team and say, okay, you guys are just like this other team, or you're just mm-hmm. like this other player. Well, that's exactly what they're probably feeling. What I felt was, you know, it's a situation where then you're put in a box and you are supposed to feel this certain way, and there's expectation when that is put on you instead of chosen. Well, and then you can't be yourself. Yeah. You can't be yourself. And speaking of this concept of there's not one solution, our eight-year-old was getting frustrated with our six-year-old because our six-year-old was trying to spin a shot to the basket using two hands. And uh, our eight-year-old said to her, you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. You're not doing it right. And again, that struck me because such an important part of coaching for me is that after she said that, I immediately stopped her and I started to re-explain to her that her solution may not be the best solution for our six-year-old. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good and, one. And I relate that so much to coaching too. And I won't, like, there's so many times where I'm, I'm getting, as you know, I get a lot of coaches reaching out to me, asking me questions, obviously supporting what I do, which is wonderful. But one of the things that sometimes comes clear to me is how often I get people saying like, listen, I have a lot of like-minded coaches on the podcast. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's true at all. Mm. I disagree with a lot of what the coaches say Mm. that are on the podcast. But as you know, when you judge another, you judge yourself. And there's no point in time Mm. at this point in my coaching career, especially where I say someone's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was trying to explain to our oldest. Like, she's not wrong. No. It's just not your solution. It's a different way. Yeah. And I just want coaches to always understand that in terms of how I'm trying to approach this is I'm not here to dictate. Mm -hmm. This brings up another thing that you mentioned recently. Mm -hmm. When you've heard me say this and you've heard coaches say this, why do you not like it when a coach would say, I stole that from someone or I steal that? Mm. I feel like the word stealing is just negative and it gets stealings against the law. So it just is like, and not that, you know, but I mean, 
It just sounds like it's a negative connotation, whereas you're not stealing from someone. You've learned something from someone and then you've adapted it probably in some way to make it your own. Which is we adopt or we adapt. We don't steal. Mm. And I've since you mentioned that to me, like it really struck me that, yes, we want to acknowledge where it came from. We want to honor where it came from. But stealing is probably not the best word. And we should start to talk in terms of we adopted it or we adapted it. And I really, again, come back to that in our basketball immersion community, especially like I always want to phrase it that way to coaches like, look, you can adopt this, but I prefer that you adapt it Mm. because that's me giving something to you Mm. that you make your own or you make Mm. better or you improve. And really, it's been the biggest gift of the basketball immersion community and and the basketball podcast is and obviously sharing on Twitter and social media, etc. is just giving stuff to coaches. And then the things that I get back in return is obviously, you know, yes, there's people that thank me and gratitude, but mainly it's, wow, they had a better idea or they added to it. Mm -hmm. And then I become a better coach. And that's Mm -hmm. the whole point of the sharing community. Mm -hmm. Share the game. Share the game. One of those original things that, you know, we came up with. My wife was obviously with me on the start of basketball immersion and she runs an online business, as I mentioned in the uh, introduction. In Canada, we had five years of eligibility. My wife played five years at Queen's University. Great experience. Loved playing basketball. Still loves playing basketball. But uh, reflect on some of those things that uh, you've learned since that would have helped you improve your game. Definitely, I would say things like understanding blocked and random practice. And even as a former you know, phys ed grad, I remember studying that and not even really kind of connecting it with the game I was currently practicing after that period was over. And it's so funny to think that because I was just taught a certain way and it included completely all those things that kind of, you know, three-man weave was my jam. I was so good at the three-man weave. And, you know, I became a really good practice player and love practice. And then I would get into a game and literally, I think there was not more than a thousand occasions that would have been Jen is a deer in headlights in the game. Like my coaches bless them and their patience that they never knew who sometimes they were going to get in a game, but they knew who they were going to get in practice because I could practice. And I mean, I don't even know specifically, just... But you understand now that game, acting the way like you the practice, practice is a game. Yeah, but yeah, the way I you... Didn't. The way you practice wasn't the same as the way you played the game because your practice was so scripted. It was so organized. It was you follow these steps and do this and then you're good. Mm -hmm. But the game is not that way. Not good in most of the case. Well, and the other part that comes up with that is that people expect to be taught the way they're used to being taught. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you're used to being taught. And it's definitely something that there's still a resistance to what I'm saying, which is to coach the game by playing the game Mm -hmm. because that's so foreign to so many people. It was so intimidating to me. I think at some level I knew that was what I needed to do to really be good. And instead I wanted to go to the gym and take shots because I was like, that felt safe and comfortable. Dribbling didn't feel comfortable. Doing things that were against defender all the time didn't feel comfortable. It took away my joy for the game. I was like, I want to just shoot. Like now that's my jam, right? Well, you're a very good shooter. <laughs> well, but yeah, but now it's soothing and like rhythmic and just very chillax. Whereas for me, a game was like a hyper stress situation. And I never knew, I did not trust myself in the situation to like just show up. So shifting gears a little bit. So what also struck me through all these conversations is It seems to me a separator between good and great coaches is what I would call aftercare, Mm. aftercare. And a big topic for you is emotional fitness. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's this emotional fitness, this ability to be able to help players with their emotional fitness, obviously to take care of our emotional fitness as coaches. And I feel like this aftercare these moments after practice, these moments after games, these moments to a certain extent preceding practice, preceding games, where you can create the right mindset, the right environment, the right emotional fitness for players. Can Let's start with first. Can you explain a little bit of emotional fitness for coaches? Uh, I mean, the word fitness in general, I like to think of as a certain level of Uh, strength, let's say, cardiovascular strength, whether it's lifting weights kind of strength, muscular strength, or the strength of 
just our heart to be able to be variable. So our heart rate variability, our ability to go up and then go back down. So a measure of someone's fitness often is not necessarily how hard they can go, but how fast they can recover after they're done. So for me, I mean, we're hit with emotional things all day long. And when we think of all things considered, you know, we, I live a very emotional life. My life is very much about being in touch with my emotions, myself, my connection to me, which is my felt perception and my feelings and not necessarily just my mind and what my mind is saying. I'm happy or I'm sad. It's my feeling in my body. And the same thing with fitness. It's, is your body able to physically recover from working out hard? If I'm pushed in some direction in my life, feeling stressed or emotional, am I able to recover back? And same thing in a basketball game or in a coaching situation, right? It's like, okay, you might get a phone call right before you go out, or you might get, you know, you might've had a bad day or you get stuck in traffic. And if you aren't emotionally fit so that you're able to get back to you, the you that is centered, these, the, the person who is un phased by the happenings going around because if you're that person it's like you're you know off in the wind every minute so I feel like it's very connected to fitness in a sort of a, the mind and the body emotional fitness would be for the mind and the and and physical fitness would be for the body and the physical fitness piece and the body's relationship is, is sort of subconscious like we can train the body, but really it's just doing its own thing. We can just train it to the best of our body's ability. We don't have that much control. Whereas in our mind, we actually can control our thoughts. We can control what we experience, what we expose ourselves to, what Twitter feed we follow. We have choice and that's where we differ from animals and where we really can elevate ourselves in as coaches or as humans on this planet, sharing one together is that emotional fitness and connecting back with getting back to that homeostasis, that Zen place that you need to be to actually be at your best, whatever that is for you. When we're talking about Zen, but I just want to clarify for coaches. So even though we're talking, the word fitness is being used. What I'm saying is a separator between good and great coaches from what I've observed from coaches at all sports and all levels is this ability to be able to help players to help themselves with mental recovery, with mm -hmm. mentally moving on, with mentally adjusting or mentally, as my wife said, getting back to a place of center and not dealing with these negative emotions. And again, I mean, so the reason I'm sharing this and one of the reasons I wanted to have this podcast was because I want so many of you coaches to learn from the struggles and the mistakes I feel I made as a coach. And, and that was definitely this area of the emotional fitness that, and this aftercare, this ability to be able to connect with players after a hard practice, after not even necessarily caused by me, but they just had a bad practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where was I, or where am I to be able to help them and connect with them? So I guess that's my question is the, what is this aftercare? What is this aftercare that I feel separates? And I hear it a lot they don't use that term. That's my term. But I hear that a lot when I talk to coaches on these podcasts too, that I just sense that this is this aftercare. These moments where they reconnect, connect with players after practice, after games to be able to get the players back to center. Mm. Can you give us some techniques for me to help myself get back to center? So... The first one would be to become aware that you are off centered because if you can notice when that's happening and you can almost just be at that point to be the seer of yourself and say, oh, wow. And with a compassionate eye, not a anger towards yourself, but with compassion saying, oh, wow, coach, hey, you're getting back into that. Oh, you're about to. OK, that is going to be that again. Right. When you kind of go off the deep end. So then you realize, okay, I'm not at center. I'm not at the place where I would like to be right now to get into this game or have the success that I need. So the first thing you, you become aware and you identify it. So that's good. So you became aware. Now you know that in advance of going down that path, you can stop yourself perhaps. Okay, so what does that look like to stop yourself? That begins, and the first one's awareness is A. B is breathing. And the key thing with breathing is to become conscious of your breath in that moment, because our breath is connected to our nervous system, which is calming 
or it's fight and flight mode. So probably if we're not in that Zen centered state, we're in the fight and flight mode. Our breath, taking a really big audible inhale and a sigh, whether just a quiet sigh or a really loud audible sigh, you will calm your nervous system down instantly and kind of give yourself a little wake up and that kind of breath. Then you can, you know, either do a one inhale, one exhale, or one inhale, two exhale for a count, just to calm and connect with your breathing. That will give you sort of an ability to be in the here and now, not in the future or in the past or in your head. To connect that for coaches, it's the same process for learning a skill. It has to be conscious before it's unconscious. Mm -hmm. So we've got to connect that in terms of, I've got to be aware of it. I've got to be able to improve it. And, and what you just went into is not just applicable to after it's during games, it's during emotions. It's being able to maintain this stoic state, which is mm -hmm. also something that seems to be a, a pretty good separator of the better coaches. They're able to maintain the stoic state mm -hmm. within their coaching. Yeah. Well, and I think it comes back to really being aware of how you want the situation to go, right? And if you're aware that you want to be more calm and centered, like you were at the end of your career, you know, you used to say, hey, how was I today? Hey, was I calmer? Hey, how did I look out there? And, you know, for me, I always look great. So I maybe I'm not the best judge. But uh, I mean, you were really focused on you had some tools, you would either touch your ring or touch your bracelet, you kind of had these little things that for you centered you. So you became aware in the later years. And that was for yourself. It was never a thing for me. But in, then when you realize you were aware, okay, now what am I going to do? Okay, you would breathe, you definitely breathe. But you would also have these little other tools. So like you said, right? Other things that can bring you back. For me, the, the third part, just to finish that off, the ABC, the C is the core value. And I think this is where it comes back to the aftercare part too. But even in this initial part, you're breathing. And then in that breathing, while you're sitting there breathing and you're present, you get into what's really your core value or what's the core decision you need to make or what's the core hope you need to have right now or whatever you're looking for. If you can get to the core of it, specifically starting with a value, you're going to be aligned and centered in what you really stand for. And I think sometimes that's taken for granted. We don't go, what do we really value? Because we get caught up in our head about all this other drama. And it's like, okay, I value these kids having a really great experience on my team. Hold the phone. That's not happening right now. Let me get back to my center. And that's so key. Like it can't just be off, oh, breathing and techniques. That's all still in your head. The ring, the bracelet, those are physical. Those are still physical mind body techniques. But if you can get to the value, which then connects to the emotional side, it taps into something so much deeper than you. And it goes beyond this here and this here and now for meaning in terms of just having meaning. Because meaning is what is the whole purpose of bringing you together. And these are learned behaviors. We can learn this, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. And that's Absolutely. the thing that I think sometimes is, is lost when we talk about mental skills or psychology or, you know, what we're talking about in this example. And that's the fact that we can learn this. Mm -hmm. Like we, it's the same way we learn physical skills. Well, we've learned the alternative. Like we've learned, you learn to freak out first because you didn't know how else to deal with your emotions. Then you learned techniques to deal with your emotions and get you back to that place. It's all learned. Like that's the cool part. And that's neuroplasticity. That's, you know, one of my happy places is neuroscience, but learning that our brains are plastic. That means whatever is today here and now that we are not happy with, we can change. That's a beautiful thing. It's a powerful thing for coaches to understand. And one of the most powerful things that I've learned is, is that concept of saying, look, okay, if I don't like something, okay, if I don't like the fact that you left a towel out, I could change that. Mm -hmm. I can change that in a number of ways. Obviously, I can change that by asking you to move it or I can move it myself. And I think so often as coaches, instead of teaching others the behavior, can you please move your towel? I would resort to, oh, I'm just going to do it myself or I'm going to get frustrated because they don't already know how to do it. Mm -hmm. This is part of this whole process for me in this journey where I feel that 
I've become better as a coach because I've learned some of these things. Well, I think we think everyone has the same perspective as us. And that's where we get into danger. That's the back to the generalizations. And you assume that I see the towel on the floor and I dropped it and kept going. And so it's an interesting thing to assume that someone else sees the way you see. Well, now everyone thinks we fight over towels and we really Fantastic. don't, but just a great, great, <laughs> great, great example. I think just trying to bring analogies home. And so like you've seen it, how hard it was for me to coach the way I teach removed from competition. And I'll give you context to that. It's not as scandalous, scandalous as it seems, but my wife took my art of coaching class at Queens University when I taught it there. So she has seen me teach in a classroom setting. She's seen me speak in a clinic setting. She's seen me run and coach practices. I feel like there's such a difference sometimes between me in a competitive situation where I'm going to be evaluated based on wins and losses and a situation where I'm simply there to share and to give. Well, I think one of the things that you said to me early on in our relationship, or maybe you shared it in the class when I first discovered you and your brilliance, it was you don't dance to get to the end of the dance floor. And I think with coaching for you, it wasn't just about wins and losses, but that was your job. So it had to be just about wins and losses. So there was this discord, I think a little bit for you and where it was what brought you so much fulfillment, all the creative side, the art of coaching, the philosophy, all the technical, tactical, you loved all the parts. Plus you wore a thousand other hats in your job it all collided in a way that was no serving the best self of you. Whereas there are certain aspects of it that do, and those you can choose to focus on. Well, there's a lot of ways that we can go with this conversation. It'll go a lot of places, but one of them is just as coaches, we're not very good at celebrating small victories. We don't celebrate enough with our players. We don't celebrate enough with ourselves, with our families, small things. It's always just a big thing. Oh, we want a big game or we won this championship or we won that. And what I learned again, as my career progressed was this ability to be able to enjoy those smaller moments. But I knew that already, like all of this reconnects back to who I really am, which is really like this philosophical person that connected at a young age with Zen and Buddhism and all these different things. But then it was such a duality with coaching for sure, where you feel so competitive in these different things. And it's a cliche. Every coach, Oh, just be yourself. Mm. Still people are uncovering and discovering themselves on their deathbeds. (laughs) I've seen it firsthand. So I think that's the interesting thing is that we don't actually know who we are because we wear so many hats. And I saw a number of your hats, right? I'd see you on the court. And I remember in the early days when I, we were dating and we used to come to the games and people would kind of look at me when they saw you coaching out there and it was so intense. And I'm like, I know if he, imagine if he yelled at me like that, like, oh my gosh, like it was such a stark contrast to how you spoke to me and our relationship or how you spoke to anyone, really how you were in a game in terms of your intensity. It was not demeaning or anything negative. It was just so intense. And I'm like, whoa, that level of intensity, this is like, there's no place for it in our relationship. So I would never see it or they would never see it. And it's so intense. So it's an interesting thing that it brings out certain personas depending on the things that we find ourselves doing. And I think a lot of us are attracted to doing things that bring out a certain persona that we feel very powerful or we feel very good about ourselves or this or that. But really when it comes down to it and we have to come back to that centered place, sometimes we don't really feel good about ourselves. And you were strong enough to admit that about yourself, which was hard. Oh, it's very hard. I'm sure. I never even saw it. Like no. I was a ha- I loved you in your job, doing your job, and us living the life of a family, of a coach, going to the game, celebrating the seasons, all the things, the players. I loved all of it. But the games did not bring out the best of you for you. So I loved seeing players grow. I loved seeing players improve as people. You know, little details like I would correct their grammar constantly, different things like that, because you think about bigger picture of where they're going to be beyond those four or five years with you. Like all those things were in place. So I, I didn't not do those things, but I definitely created obsessed with creating toughness and competitiveness early in my career. 
in a practice, in our environment, in our accountability. And I just felt like I, and I do feel like this now, especially, and I got better at this clearly as a coach and I hope I am much better now, but I loved coaching so much, but I never showed it. Mm. I didn't let my players see that mm. enough. And they just, I was what constantly. Would have, what would that have looked like if you did show them? Well, just more outward joy, more outward enjoy. And again, I mean, you see me Smiley. interact with you, interact yeah. with my daughter. Mm-hmm. You see me at clinics. You see me talk to people. Like it's a different have a personality. Yeah, it's a different personality almost in a sense. But it's almost like as coaches, we feel that if we, if we let up on our players or we, mm-hmm. you know, don't hold them accountable to every little thing, then it's like. Mm-hmm. We're gonna lose because of that, mm-hmm. and it's such a such a betrayal of a coach. And those were my role models early on as well that I was unconsciously imitating. But mm-hmm. th- as you said, the main thing was even while that was all happening from the get go, I was consciously aware of that's not how I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. That's not how I wanted to coach. That's not what I wanted. You were. That's not what I wanted. Um, my personal identity to be as a coach, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and. Certainly, I was fighting it sometimes, but I was definitely aware with it. Aware with it, but I do feel like. So now, do you feel like you can still create a competitive environment like that, even if? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I guess uh, yes. I mean, I believe so. I mean, done a number of things actually recently, which have kind of brought that to light. Is so we did a heart opening ceremony. Do you want to quickly explain that? So this was a opportunity to do a plant medicine journey with a shaman and have an experience that would open up our mind, body, and heart to seeing and experiencing and feeling things that we don't feel on a regular daily basis. That we hide or we push down or we, you know, whether it's through trauma or just through, again, sometimes the roles we have to maintain. Yeah, exactly. And and coaches, really, I mean, this is us. We fill this role. Yes. This identity, public identity. You're right. That others hold us to. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, it's interesting how, how expectations of how we should be put us into these boxes that we think people put us into and that they are us, but they aren't. And we get sometimes too caught up in that. So this heart opening ceremony was a great opportunity for you and I to let all our guards down. Part that I want to bring for coaches so they get some practical because I'm obsessed with practical, as you know. Yes. What does it mean to honor someone? Because this is something that's come through. You've taught me this through our daughters is that basically if one of our daughters wants to do something, then obviously if it's safe, like beyond it, let's assume all that it's safe. It's why not? Yeah. That sometimes we impose Mm -hmm. our belief or ourselves onto them and say, no, not doing that. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, why can't she do that? Why can't she have that? Honor them, honor what they want or what they think. And that came through with this heart opening ceremony as well, is this honoring of myself, but honoring Mm. of, you know, my, my identity, who I was. Mm. I'm I'm happy you kind of connected that with the kids and with the heart opening ceremony, because it's interesting. And when I say kids, it relates to players. Right. From a coach's perspective. Sure. It means honor people, honor. So what does that mean? Well, so, you know, we can easily dismiss either children or players or others around us as knowing or not knowing things. They know less than us or they need to listen to us and we are the boss or we're in charge. It's an easy dynamic, especially as a coach, player or parent child to say, I know better than you. I've been doing this for this many years. I've seen it all. La, la, la. And I I mean, I mean, I learned early in my life about Zen and uh, thankfully to you, I started to explore this idea of a blank slate or a no mind situation like a carte blanche and this idea that you can show up to each experience and it's new. And I feel every day our kids teach us more than they need to learn from me. I can hold space for them by keeping a safe home and, you know, engaging them in, in, all the ways, but being open to learning is the way to honor 
each other. And I think when it comes to our players, it's not, okay, yeah, they don't want to run lines or they don't want to do this or that. Okay. But you know what? How about they each have a voice and are you really listening to them or are you not? And I think it's just one of those things. It's like, we don't even make eye contact. We don't even see them. Oh, they're little people. Oh, they don't know what they're talking about. They do. And they're wise and they're smart beyond words. And it's interesting that you brought up the heart opening ceremony because I feel like that gave us an opportunity to be in that sort of a no mind place where we didn't have judgments of each other. And it wasn't, you know, all these expectations. It was just seeing each other in our fullness of love and knowing that we always do our best to honor one another. So such an important part of coaching to honor others to honor truly our players listen, to, to, truly honor, to truly be present here yeah it's a it's about presence like we say you know even our kids our kids today they're home from school now and they're like hey you're not really paying attention because i'm on my phone at the same time I'm like yeah yeah then i'm like oh yeah they really know i'm not paying attention right now i'm not listening to them and people know when you're not really present they know when you're putting them in the box and generalizing they know when you're treating them like all the others and they don't feel that's fair they know. So I've been thinking about that in the process and a coach is Googling heart opening ceremony. Don't, don't worry. But <laughs> just, just contact Jen and she'll tell you all about it. But what it kind of came back to me is don't coach it out of them. Like we spend so much time as coaches yeah. coaching things out of players mm. rather than honoring them. Yeah. Now they have to fit within our non-negotiables, but beyond that, sometimes players just have better solutions. They come up with better things. Now, I'm not saying don't coach it, but what I mean by coaching is inform it, guide it, enhance it, teach when to apply it rather than coaching it out of them. Mm. That's my version of taking honoring them Mm. to the sports environment. Hey coach, going to interrupt this podcast for a brief message from show partner, Simply Safe. With home security, there's two ways you can go about protecting your home. There's the traditional way where you wait weeks for a technician to do a messy installation that costs a small fortune, or there's the other way, Simply Safe. Simply Safe is everything you need in a home security system. It's award winning protection, two time winner of CNET Editor's Choice Award. Simply Safe blankets your whole home in safety. You get comprehensive protection for your entire home. Outdoor cameras and doorbells alert you to anyone approaching your home. Entry, motion, and glass break sensors guard inside. You barely notice it's there, but what's truly remarkable is you can set up this system all by yourself. Anyone can do it. It takes 30 minutes to an hour tops, and there's absolutely no trade-offs to your safety. You'll have an army of highly trained security experts ready to dispatch police to your home at a moment's notice 24-7. And it's only 50 cents a day with no contracts. It's why The Verge calls Simply Safe the best home security system. Go to simplysafe.com slash team today and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. You've got nothing to lose. Go now and be sure you go to simplysafe.com slash team. That's simplysafe.com slash team. I like it because it's within a framework, right? And that's the big thing is that, you know, our children and you know, we were, we were raised in an education system where it was like, Hey, go memorize this. Hey, do this. Hey, go do this. Hey, do that over and over and over. Right. You now bring in the principles of learning and actually remembering versus memorizing. Right. And that learning, that connection. And I think that bringing that back allows the creativity and the who the person really is to shine through. I mean, I was in my 30s before I realized as a coach, and I coach people in their mind and body and health and nutrition and fitness and all that stuff, that kind of coach, I always just look to the science and the articles and my degrees and what else I had to learn. And I didn't even insert the amazing me into it to realize that just the things that I've lived through in my whole life, the things that I love to read about, to do, to spend time with are all an important part of who I am as a coach. That's valuable. And that's valuable to know as yourself. It's also valuable to know that each player is an individual as is each child. And you can try and coach it out of them or tell them not to do certain things, but it's there for them. And if you honor them and let them blossom like a flower instead 
by creating that perfect soil, it's so much more valuable and they will come back and thank you. Insert yourself into it. You, this probably leads us to the origin of the podcast, which is you encouraging me to insert myself more into the conversation. Can you talk about that? Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you have such a brilliant brain. You have such a strong voice. You have such an understanding and you are such a disruptor in a way that because you, you question things and you want details and you are digging in and you just want to get to more depth. And I admire that so much. And it's such a beautiful thing. So I knew you had to get out there in a bigger way. And um, a podcast, I'm a huge fan of podcasts, uh, as you know. And so I knew how to start one. I've started many. And I just said, I'm going to take this by the balls, if you will, and start this whole thing. So I did all that and then just had you be able to reach out to people and get it going. So yeah, you set it up. You encouraged me. You pushed me because originally I said no. And well, there's a lot behind it by all the admin potential. You were all the times. Oh, I have to be this. I don't want more meetings. You were doing this all while you were busy as a beaver in your job. True. So there's all those other parts, but it's also about inserting myself more, mm. which is my MO is probably to be more in the background. I didn't want this to come across in any way. Like, Mm, you know, yeah. Look at me, I'm running a podcast, like, you know, that type of thing. It's like different. So inserting myself in the right way and honoring the vision of what basketball immersion and the basketball podcast could be, which was a big part of it. And is share the game, which you're sharing openly and giving, selflessly of yourself day and night for the betterment of all coaches and all of us to share. That's amazing. Well, it's been amazing. I mean, I've got more back than I could have ever have expected from others. And, you know, that part of it is, again, like, I'm not here to create disciples. Like, I am here to share. And I, and I find that, like, coaches, even coaches that say they share, they really sometimes don't share. Well, it's how much they share. They're thinking they share maybe, so that's their level. But you have an openness and a vulnerability that you were not able to show when you were in the competitive side of your coaching. In this arena, it opens and it allows more of you to come through. And the more of you that's coming is that that seeker, that questioner, that curious boy who began this coaching journey. If I'm not mistaken... Did you not want to be a basketball coach since you were the age of six? Yeah. Well, coach. Basketball came a little bit later. But okay, but you, I, you wanted to coach. I was always intrigued by the the side. I always knew and learned at a young age, I was very blessed by this, by the way, that there was no limitation on my mind. Mm-hmm. But I was somewhat aware that there were some limitations on me physically mm. relative to some other people, whatever sport I was playing, soccer, okay. hockey. You saw other people were better just physically, naturally? Some, for sure. Yeah. Some. So, But then I knew that there was this other side, which was there's, at the time I certainly didn't know it was perceptual, but this perceptual side. It's like this decision-making side. And this was my mm. possibility. This was my mm. opportunity and by studying something, immersing in something, and just obsessing, to be honest, over yeah. something, I could improve. Mm. And that's how basketball immersion came about because, as you know, basically this summer before we traveled around the world, I did a whole bunch of basketball camps mm-hmm. where I just traveled around and I listened to podcast after podcast after podcast from online marketers and online people learning this. And this leads back to this shin concept. And the most important thing that you taught me initially and then was reinforced by all these podcasts was give away your best stuff. Give away your best stuff. And that's where I come back to what is truly sharing is, are you willing to give away your best stuff? Mm -hmm. And Not many people are. And you have a real natural giving nature. And when I, I know this for real, when I first met you... You are so cute. You're so humble. You always have been. And one of the things I remember you saying to me was that you live a life of servitude. And th- I was, you know, maybe 24 or something at the time. And I remember being really curious by that and just trying to understand. Because first, I had never heard of that really. 
that term, that idea. And then I thought I, it rang so true in my heart that I go, I like that for me, I wanted that. I wanted to live a life of servitude when you explained that. And I thought, wow, I never knew that was a thing. And it was just such a beautiful thing. And you do it beautifully. It's always struck me. I mean, like, True servitude is giving to others without expecting something in return and just how rare that is. And we've talked about that in the years, the frustration with so many players that I've coached. And it's like, okay, well, why do they need to say thank you? Why do they need to show appreciation? Why do they need to show gratitude? And then it comes back to that was me doing a disservice to them, not teaching the importance of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And now that's something I end every camp with is a conversation about gratitude and how important it is to, again, this comes back to honoring, but you know, just, to, just to be able to express gratitude because that's the thing that, would you say, centers you the most. Absolutely. It's just whatever's going on in your life to just take a moment and reflect on what you're grateful for. It, it literally goes back to the heart. And if anyone is interested, you can Google heart math, which will take you to tons of research about the actual heart and the electromagnetic frequencies and the field around the heart and how strong it is over 5,000 times stronger than the brain. So it's very interesting. We actually meet people from our heart hours and hours sometimes before we meet people with our mind or talk to them. When we walk in a room, our hearts connect with certain people in that room and it's unspoken, unseen. Now they have the technology to actually test it. And with things like wearable technologies, we can see so many different unique things regarding frequency and human emotion is quantified on a level that it's never been before. And it's just so, so, so cool. But the actual science shows that the gratitude, the space that you get into when you're in appreciation and true gratitude, not, oh, I'm happy my you know house is bigger than his, but it's when you're truly appreciative of what you have, thank you for this day. Thank you that I have this breath. Thank you that I'm here. Thank you that I have a roof over my head and truly getting in that essence. If, and that's a frequency and they measure that. So they would know if you're in it or not. When you can get into the frequency, it's called coherence and your brain and your heart are in coherence, which is means in sync and everything actually is in flow physically and mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all the things. And so your heart is directly the center point of that. So it's really valuable to get that gratitude journal out and write a little love. So as you've talked about this to me over the years, what, again, it comes back to almost every podcast, every coach in some way talks about the importance of building relationships with their players. To me, this comes back to heart coherence is how can we develop that? Because think about that. If we spent more, and this is where I beat myself up that I wasn't, a, wasn't aware and didn't do a good enough job. I did it, but not as good as I probably, well, as I definitely could have in connecting with my players from this spiritual, emotional, philosophical heart level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the heart opening and all these different things, they all kind of remind me of what a poor job I did. Mm. And again, this is why I want to share it with Compassion people. Passion and forgiveness are your two best <laughs> friends. Honey. Absolutely. But for coaches, I think they need to hear this and have some actionable ways of being able to connect on a heart level. Well, it's, it's not just a followership it, leader, follower level. Yeah. Heart level. You know what? It's as easy as asking the right questions, speaking of the right questions. But the thing is, is that it requires you first to be vulnerable. And if you're not prepared for that, it you'll have your guard up consciously or subconsciously. So I love the work of Brene Brown out of Texas and she's amazing. And you know, between her Ted talk and all the books and everything, she, her Netflix special and everything, it's really showing that we can't actually truly connect heart to heart. We really just can not as long as that guard is up and we each have a guard up or multiple, multiple guards. We close our heart hundreds of times when it's been broken, when we've been hurt, traumatized, all the different things at every level. And no one person's trauma is greater than another. It's how that person interprets it. And every single trauma is stored in the cellular level of our body and is memorized and imprinted on who we are. And it's scary to go there for many people. So just to let your guard down to say, hey, who are you going to be with this Thanksgiving? Who do you really love to see? Your aunt, your uncle, your friend? Like then they might say something scary that you're not ready to prepare to deal with. And it's a whole dynamic that you have to be ready for. And I love it because I'm like, ooh, the deeper we can go. But it's very scary. Well, there's a fear from a coach's perspective, especially that that's 
not competitive. That's not mm-hmm. tough. But what we know is that's more powerful than anything we could imagine is connecting at that heart level, right? Yeah, well, because just the electromagnetic frequency that's emitted from our body, 5,000 times greater. And just to clarify, what you said is that we are connected heart to heart with people, but what? But we've changed that by putting up barriers and building these barriers. Exactly. It's just essentially, yeah, it's not, it's like not smooth transmission to each other. It's like there's blocks, right? And there, we've been around that. We've, we know, that's the thing, even though we can't see the electromagnetic frequency of our hearts, we know when we have a warm embrace with a hug from someone or if someone's standoffish and we're like, I don't know why that person's like, do they like me? It's like this whole thing. We have all these different dynamics. We don't know where they come from, but our gut has an intelligence. That's our enteric nervous system, part of our autonomic nervous system system and we don't trust it enough that's our intuition and we go oh that's woo woo or that's whatever right and it's about trusting talk about gut brain quickly that's it yeah. that's that part of the nervous system we know the parasympathetic the sympathetic as i talked about earlier rest and digest is parasympathetic sympathetic is fight and flight which we spend too much time in as a human race And then there's the enteric nervous system, which is literally where neurons, nerve cells from our brains are in our gut, in our belly area, in our core. And we are constantly being informed by these neurons. They are of great intelligence regarding our immunity, which is housed in our gut, regarding all the different things that are in our microbiome, it's unbelievable what's actually going on on so many different levels that we don't know, but our body is being regulated by that. And that's that homeostasis we all want to be staying in, but we ignore it and we give more value to our brains because we've educated them and we've read all these books and we read all the science and we know all these things. But actually, if we can get out of our brain in that high frequency beta state, which is our our brain waves that are going way too fast and just drop it down to that centered Zen space, we can just get so much more clarity and we feel more grounded and that's where we make better decisions and we are more of ourselves that we want to be. Uh, Real quickly, we got to get to this, but tell us about a 12 second pitch. Hmm. Okay. Well, I think it's probably the best way even to say it would be like a 10 second pitch because our, every single year, our attention span is getting shorter. And so years ago, it was like 15 seconds, a man would listen to you. And now it's probably closer to 10. And a woman probably it's closer to six, like they're going, Oh, I'm diverting my eyes. I'm not interested in what you're saying. And so when we introduce ourselves to someone, we go on a long diatribe about something, or we just don't really interest them in any way, whether it's online, our posts, our videos, anything. As a coach, we start talking to our players and they're all just like falling asleep. So use the first 10 seconds or when you introduce yourself, say something to someone that is of interest to them. Make them the person that you're talking about or talk about who you want to help or be with your 10 second pitch. So the, the art of conversation, right? Sense. No, yeah. it makes sense because, again, coaches ultimately are branding themselves, just like yes. most people nowadays. You got to brand yourself. Mm-hmm. So, this 12 second pitch, 10 second pitch mm-hmm. is such an important part of branding yourself. Mm-hmm. And where I'm going with this a little bit too is that, as you know, I'm, I'm grateful for so many social media followers. I literally go and look at the list of who follows as at the end of the day or some point in the day, and I'll look and just say, okay, with the people that are following. Most of the time, I can't tell anything about that person from Mm -hmm. their Twitter profile. Mm -hmm. And you know how much that frustrates me because there's an opportunity for someone to brand themselves Mm -hmm. and for us to connect in some way. Mm -hmm. And honestly, uh, like somebody puts, for example, I'm Twitter profile, East, West, North, South basketball. (laughs) And that's it. Or somebody puts... Just basketball coach. Mm, yeah. Doesn't, yeah. <laughs> I would say missed opportunity. And that's really social media now is our resume. And everybody searches you. Even if they're going to go see you up the road or join your school or team, they're going to search you first. And I think the 10-second pitch idea is is really your, your initial first look, right? It's who is this person? What do they have to offer? And it's not that you're trying to make yourself sound better than you are. You're just trying to be clear so someone can in an instant go, oh, he's the basketball coach of this school in this city or whatever. Yeah, sometimes people just put like University of Maryland. Right. So I don't know if they're University of Maryland. or this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then 
how much effort am I going to put into it and mm-hmm. look? Mm-hmm. And sometimes, obviously, people can put something that's intriguing that you're like, oh, I'll look. Right. Most of the time, it's just you move on. And it's like... You're doing yourself a disservice, for sure. And I wanted to get that out there because I just think that's an easy, mm-hmm. easy, actual way that I think we can all learn. And then so many coaches are involved in branding, recruiting, etc. that mm-hmm. this, this concept of engaging people with this type of ability to be able to have that conversation that engages someone back really quickly as well. So ask questions, take interest in people. Those really will get you far in life, right? Absolutely. And, uh, this brings me to a blog that I've been sitting on for a long time, as you know, on feedback, and I've been wanting to get it out there and I've wanted to share the ideas and maybe this is a better place to be able to do that. I agree. This is one of those things that I believe is not known enough by coaches because we still go by this traditional concept of feedback. So the traditional concept of feedback is the sandwich approach, the sandwich approach to coaching. So great job shooting the ball, but you need to hold your fall through, but you're doing a good job with your legs. You know, that type of thing. So compliment and then sandwich it with a negative. Positive, negative, positive. Yeah. So this sandwich approach is in all the coaching journals. It's in so much. And so many coaches talk about it still. And and to me, what it relates to in terms of so many things is I'll tell you a quick story. I was at Coaching You speaking. Really famous basketball programs, assistant coach left in the middle of my presentation. So before the presentation, so many people coming up to, up to me, talking to me about how much they appreciated me with the podcast, with the Twitter, with basketball immersion members, all these people are coming and saying good things to me. After the presentation, so many people came up and said really good things about the presentation. The first thing, when I talked to you on the phone, you asked me, right. how was the presentation? So-and-so walked out. So-and-so walked out. The sandwich approach. You don't know how someone's going to internalize things if you aren't specific about your feedback. And to me, everyone would go, oh, he must have felt really good about that. And I felt awful because I was fixated on the one thing in the middle of the sandwich, Mm -hmm. which is this assistant coach left in the middle of my presentation. And that's a huge part for coaches to understand is that when we're not very specific and very actionable with our feedback, then things get lost. Now, where this comes back to is sex. Is It's a real simple way for everyone to understand it. And there's two ways that we do this. One is that my view of how to do and, and to be able to provide feedback for my players and potentially for you in sex or you to me in sex is keep and add. Keep doing something, add this. So you're giving me something that I'm doing well, and then you're telling me something that I can improve. Think about how much that's improving because again, let's be honest, sex is a great analogy because you're fearful to give feedback that would truly help me improve your experience. Well, coaching is the same. We're very sometimes fearful about giving the specific information because we're worried about hurting the player's feelings or we're worrying about how they're going to interpret. Mm -hmm. So what I've learned through so much of this, and I full credit to wherever I adapted this, but keep and add has become a part of my coaching lexicon. That's been the most important thing that I've added over the last few years. Keep your great follow through, add your summation of joint forces so your legs work together. I don't know <laughs> how that comes up on the spur of the moment. I can't get a figure yeah. out what that is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Anyways, you get the idea. <laughs> Keep and add. Keep and add. Yes? Yes. The other one is communication while play is going on versus communication while play is stopped. Feedback while play is going on versus feedback while play is stopped. Mm-hmm. After Say we play three trips to the floor, we come back, and now as a coach, I give you feedback. Right. I give you feedback. Okay, great. It's after the fact. So what I have done through my coaching over the years is develop this concept of hold, recreate, Mm -hmm. feedback in the context of the play, and now continue the play. Mm -hmm. So they get feedback somewhere where they can have a chance to change it, have a different possibility. I love it. The other thing is 
this concept of following feedback with action. Too often as coaches, we give feedback at a time when players can't act on it. Totally. They can't act on it. So it's great. Okay, I give them all the feedback. Now, hey, make sure you remember that for tomorrow because that's when we're going to practice it or you got to use it in the game. Some things that I wanted to make sure that I brought out for coaches is some of those ideas that, that come from feedback. And I think that's just something that we can think a little bit deeper about in terms of that. So we talked a little bit about me starting basketball immersion. And uh, one of the things that uh, came through to me is this, uh, this concept of replacing compliance with curiosity. Mm. So That's what you do in basketball immersion, yeah. Absolutely. Because mm-hmm. so much of coaching is, well, do it the way someone else does it or do the way that you were taught. Mm-hmm. And what I tried to create with basketball immersion is basically an outlet for curiosity. Mm-hmm. It, because I've had this great benefit of being a full-time coach, but this great benefit of obviously I have many coaching experiences where I wasn't limited to one team. So I could through trial and error and all these different things, I could fail, I could succeed and all these different things. So be able to kind of add this many curiosity, mentors and many mentors and still continue your masters and all your extra. So the, the analogy that I brought up a little bit in terms of this is this concept of what I do to try and explain it to people that maybe don't know is basically it's a home makeover show. I'm one of those people that comes into your home or that's the benefit of obviously being a part of our membership or following some of the things that we share and whatnot is that I'm there to make over what you do. Like I'm not there to tell you what to do. I'm not there to choose the tiles. Choose the tiles. I'm not there to tell you you got to like blue when you like green. I'm there in that sense. Do I want to help coaches have that wow makeover feeling and to add to what they do to complement what they do and to, in some cases, make over what they do. So that type of concept that goes with it. I love it. Great analogy, coach. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> How have we sustained a 10 plus year marriage and 14 plus year relationship with this coaching life? Cause I, I it's, it's awesome. I do get asked quite a bit about talking about right. relationships cause it, it does seem like coaches struggle somewhat with relationships with because and our really good friend Larry Shy mentioned this on the podcast I did with him and that's that no matter what it's an imbalance of time I'm going to spend way more time in season with my team than I am with my family Mm -hmm. so how do I make sure that I make that time count or to obviously improve that and what are some things that we've done maybe i mean the thing that stands out to me is that i truly believe quality time trumps quantity anyways and sometimes people spend so much time together they just speak to each other like they would never speak to anyone else so that never happened for us we always have so much respect and excitement to see each other because we didn't have that much time always together and you were gone or you know at games or practice or whatever. So I feel like in that sense, um, your absence truly fueled an opportunity for us to have really quality time. And that allowed us to be very intentional with our time and be present and choose to do certain things. We chose to travel, even though, you know, you're always gone or I was always gone. We love travel and discovering new places. And that was one of our first loves was road trips or flights or, you know, we've saw so much of the world together before we even had kids. And that's because we enjoy the same types of things. So I think also finding someone who fun together. And I think it's a lot about wanting it to work and just choosing it. I think it's about choosing something and committing to it and doing it with all that you've got. And I think that's what we do as coaches or players or people, right? If we are, and you know, you commit to that school, gave it everything you got, you had while you were there. And you leave it all on the floor, right? And I think that's what we've done in our relationship. There's just, we just want it. Like who wins? The ones who want it bad enough. Right. And find a way. And we've talked about that, that certain things that be, would normally be weaknesses have become strengths. For example, when I would come back from road trips, I would encourage you to go on your own and do something by yourself. Mm-hmm. Like you think immediately it's about us being together, but sometimes it's about you having your own time to yourself. Well, Say you're with the kids, kids yeah. right? And then another part we've talked about is traveling separately. Right. 
that we both had opportunities to be able to travel separately. And it's okay if you go away for a bunch of days. It's awesome. Like I welcome it. I embrace it because, I mean, it's not about guilt for me. It's about I know that you get to have that experience of being able to honor yourself and spend time with yourself as well. One of the things you've always honored in me was that you liked, appreciated, and were happy that I had my independence and liked to do my own thing. That, I think, something too, is whether it's a hobby or a job or whatever, is for each individual to have their own thing. And it's not like, oh, I need you to complete me. That is where, you know, it can be a lot of stress on coaches if a woman wants more of them than they can even possibly give. And I understand that with men. Yeah, absolutely. Either way, absolutely, both ways. But I I know for me, um, you know, I have a lot of women that I work with and I have been in my life and women have certain needs emotionally and presence wise. And if some, if a man can be in present in a quality situation, like you are being there, not just being around. It's not like, oh, you're the third kid that pops in and I have to still clean up after you. It's like when you're home, you do everything. You take care of everything for me because you know I'm doing it the whole time you're gone. And then I still want to do things, but you have a natural intention with every day to make my life easier, to make my life better within the parameters of your own life that you can do. And I think you setting your own boundaries has taught me to set mine and you honoring those things in me has allowed me permission and also has allowed me a greater opportunity to then come back and contribute to our family much greater. And you figured that out pretty early. Well, and it goes both ways in terms of what you just said, because that's definitely it. And I'm glad you brought that to light because I think that's been such a huge part. And I think coaches can, again, those are that specific actionable information about, again, honoring each other. And it comes back to that is that uh, if we're truly invested in this, like we are, then I want to serve you, to help you, to provide for you in whatever your needs may be. Well, and, and you've the same for me. Yeah. And that and that's a beautiful thing to communicate and to understand. And that's the story that I can be telling myself every day, or I can choose to be telling myself the story of, oh, he never wants to be around. Oh, he's so busy. Oh, he doesn't have time for me. Oh, he doesn't even like me. I could be in a spiraling out of wherever, or I could be completely grounded and centered knowing that I have something amazing and I'm so grateful for every single day I get to be with this person. And coming back to the feedback, just how many coaches and spouses, either way, don't communicate truly what they need. And it's it's scary to communicate openly and honestly. Think about that, that we're probably much better at telling our players openly and honestly what needs to be present for our relationship to succeed yeah. versus our, our spouse, our significant other. Totally, 100%, for sure. I'll say that because it is hard to talk about things, even sex, while you're having sex, it's hard to talk about it. It's the craziest thing. So of course we're gonna shy away because that's openness, that's open heart, that's full exposure. And oh my God, now I'm gonna get rejected, told. And so I think the greatest thing we can do as coaches or humans is let our ego kind of hang out in the back seat, but not drive the car, right? And if we have, what I always say to my clients is our right hand and our left hand are compassion and forgiveness. And those are our very, very best tools we can use in this world. And when we go out in the world and it's a big, scary world, we can put our own hands on ourselves and hug ourselves. And with compassion saying, I understand where you are. Life's hard. And forgiveness saying, I understand where you were before or where you'll be. You don't, you're just doing your best. I forgive you. And that can be some real powerful words. We have to hear sometimes from ourselves first before we can ever say that to someone else or expect someone else to say that to us. It's kind of a joke, but a real practical way to do this. And coaches have brought this up, by the way, with assistant coaches giving head coaches information is like write a little note, put it on your on their desk so you don't say it face to face. It's the same thing in our relationship. We have a little joke that's like, Jen, if there's something, email me. Mm-hmm. So I've seen it first so I can process it. And so I can kind of, because again, removes the emotion of it in the moment to have a real conversation. And if it's big news or big emotional yeah. content of whatever sort. And I'm not saying do that all the time because we've obviously got better at face to face. You telling me what you need or me telling you what you need uh, in terms of the relationship. So, but 
coaches, I think this part, so many relationships get broken because people won't talk mm. about what they really need. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And, and they form these stories that tell them some fallacy. One of my favorite lines I've stolen from you, which I've used a lot, especially in my latter years at Windsor, was the story I'm telling myself. The story Brene you're Brown. telling yourself. It's Brene Brown, yeah. I would start so many conversations with people that I knew were immediately going to say no or immediately be resistant or immediately not be open to possibilities by just the story you're telling yourself. or The story I'm telling myself is that you're feeling this way. And then they could tell me then if they're, if I'm right or wrong in terms of that, but it would help soften the conversation rather than me going in there and saying, Hey, you're not you supporting me. Yeah. You're not supporting me because of this. Instead, I would start that conversation with the story I'm telling myself is that you're not willing to do this because. And that softens that whole conversation. Because it is just a story. It's your perspective. Again, it's when we assume someone else has the perspective we have. Such an important language. And I hope coaches get that out of that is if you just start thinking about some of those hard conversations and starting them with the story I'm telling myself mm -hmm. the story. And that would apply to my relationship with you as well as I could have that conversation with you. Okay. We've actually brought it up a few times. Oh, I think for sure, for sure. Coaching is creating a space for learning, for exploring, for growing, for interacting, for connecting and experimenting. What does it mean to hold space for someone? To be present, to listen, possibly eye contact or touch if you're holding them for whatever reason. Holding space is allowing whatever is meant to be in that moment to come up. And so often things are bubbling around. If you think of carbonated water, think there's all these bubbles in the bubbles and the bubbles. But for the bubbles to get out of the water, eventually it's going to get flat. The bubbles have to come up to the surface and they pop. That's what we have to do too with ourselves is that there's all these things that need to come up to the surface and just be let go. Things we've held on to, things we don't even realize we're being triggered by day and night from old stories and all the things we're stuck in our heads. We're telling ourselves negative things and really just being self-deprecating. And if we can re realize, like you just said, and say, wow, the story I'm telling myself is that I'm going crazy right now over all this. That's great. Okay. Wow. I have some awareness, right? We can get back to ourselves, but sometimes we need someone else to hold space for us to be a safe space where we can just complain. You know that person you go to just complain and then they go, oh, I have this other issue that's even bigger than yours. And then they tell you all their crap. That's not holding space, right? That's them wanting to one-up you or be seen. Everybody wants to be seen. Go to someone who is prepared to see you, who doesn't need to at that moment be seen for their own, whether egoic or healing or whatever situation. I love that. Such an important part of... What I've learned being in your presence is that that concept of holding space for someone and, uh, you know, being so powerful, well, it's powerful, uh, it's impactful. And again, it's not about me, not about me, altruistic, right? It's about you or it's about us. And that's, I mean, I couldn't draw a better parallel to coaching. You know, because I, I share this all the time with coaches and I bring it up all the time is like coaching is about the mini conversations, not about the big conversations and not about the big speeches. It's about all those little moments and that concept of being able to hold space and truly connect as we've talked about a little bit on that deeper level, that heart level, not just these superficialities of, of power and control and do something because I told you to do something like if we're truly trying to inspire people, then we have to hold space for them. Absolutely. I can't thank you enough for taking time and spending some time with us, Jen. You're welcome. This is such a treat. If you're interested in following Jen Oliver, uh, best place is Instagram at love Jen Oliver. She shares so much of uh, her life, our life. Just uh, wonderful lessons for everyone. JenOliver.com is her website and the Fit Mama podcast is her podcast. Thank you so much for listening to 100th episode. I look forward to the next 100 with you. Coach, now's the time. If you are not yet a member of basketballimmersion.com and our membership community, 
join today. I want to read one testimonial to you from a coach who had tremendous success over his time as a basketball immersion member. He recently sent me this email. Shout out to Chris Oliver and the basketball immersion community. Our small high school had gotten a one provincial final from the school's opening in 1978. I took over the girls program in 2011. Since joining basketball immersion in 2016, we have been to three finals in five years, and tonight we won the first high school basketball title in school history. So many people are a part of making it happen, but zero seconds training and basketball immersion and many of the basketball immersion principles have become a big part of our program. Thanks for all you do and all your ongoing support. Coach, it's time. If you're not yet a member, join basketballimmersion.com today and get your coaching stimulated. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.